I am Claudia Janten. I am the maternal and child health specialist at CMMB. And this panel is offered by CMMB to talk about long COVID. Today we have uh, Dr. Helen Calpet. She's an internal medicine and infectious disease specialist in Santa Ana, California, uh, with more than over 20 years of experience in local public health, but also international. Uh, thank you for joining uh, Helene from California. It's quite early for you. Helene also has support CMMB for a long time. She has gone to three CMMB missions since to Mwandi in Zambia as a clinical mentor and also um, help training our volunteers. Uh, I am very grateful to have uh, Constanza Tobacia. Uh, she's a microbiologist and a medical doctor and public health specialist with more than 50 years of experience in the field of women health, sexual reproductive health, violence against women and violence against children. She has worked as a physician, as a public health practitioner with civil societies, international organizations, government programs uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean. But today, Dr. Tobacia will speak as a patient. This, um, pan, this is divided in in the first part. Uh, we will have Dr. Calvet who will explain about long COVID. And in the second part, we will listen to our guest speaker who have suffered in post COVID and present their perspective as patients, but also as a public health uh, workers. Uh, for this part and to preserve confidentiality, our fellows Rachel and Eunice will read on behalf of our colleagues from the field. Uh, the testimonies are from CMMB people and a community health worker. Uh, for those who are in the audience, uh, please post your questions in the chat box. The questions will be answered uh, and in the end. As a disclaimer, we are recording this soon event, so you will be aware. Uh, please uh, have your microphone mute. Uh, that's far to help this uh, recording process. So, Helene, Constanza, thank you so much uh, to join for this conversation. Dr. Helene, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Okay, so let me share my screen. Thanks for inviting me to speak with you today. <clears throat> As uh, Claudia mentioned, I am a volunteer with CMMB and board certified in internal medicine and infectious diseases. For the last 20 years, I've been working in local public health and the last 18 months of that has been in charge of a team of nurses that have responded to COVID outbreaks in skilled nursing facilities and older adult residential facilities in Orange County, California. So over those 18 months, we responded to over 300 outbreaks that infected thousands of residents and staff. So we have a lot of experience diagnosing COVID, recognizing COVID. I personally don't have experience treating COVID in a hospital environment because I'm based in the community, more in the preventive area. Um, and although I don't also have experience evaluating long COVID, we've seen plenty of it in the nursing homes as, as many of the patients who were infected were experiencing some of those symptoms ongoing. So before I get started with, I just wanna give some basic facts about COVID-19. This is the biggest thing in public health in a hundred years. And as of last year worldwide, there was uh, almost 220 million people infected and over 4 million deaths for a mortality ratio of over 2%. In the US, as of last week, there was over 39 million infected with over 637,000 deaths for a slightly lower mortality ratio, but still substantial. And these are likely underestimates because certainly in low resource areas, testing uh, capacity has been insufficient. And even in the US at the beginning of the pandemic, we did not have enough tests. So a lot of people who had COVID went undiagnosed which means that the numbers infected are an under uh, estimation as well as likely the numbers of deaths. We do know that there's a higher mortality in older age groups and those who have medical problems. And of those who survive, a substantial proportion can have long lasting effects after the infection, which is, is called long COVID. Fortunately, the vaccines that have come out are very effective at preventing infection and therefore are effective at preventing long COVID as well. So before I talk about long COVID, just a few words about acute COVID. Um, I'm sure all of you have experience with this, have friends, whatever have been responding to the pandemic. Um, and it, as you know, it can cause many different uh, symptoms and can involve many different organ systems. 
the virus itself can do damage several ways. It can actually directly damage cells that have receptors to the virus. And those receptors are found in lung, heart, gut, liver, nerve, and immune cells. And it causes the immune system in some cases to overreact to create what's called a hyperinflammatory state. And when the immune system causes this state, it actually can do damage to the body directly. And it also um, creates what's called a hypercoagulable state or a, it causes the blood to clot very easily. So imagine if you have damage to small blood vessels and you have blood that can clot very easily, then you can end up with blockages in both small and large blood vessels. And that lack of oxygen to organs can then further the damage caused directly by the virus or by the immune system. So again, many different organs involved, probably the most important is the lungs, as we all know, uh, can cause a cough, uh, can advance to pneumonia or cause acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS. And this is what's probably the most likely cause of death in people who die of COVID. But it also can cause a heart inflammation or myocarditis. And early on in the pandemic, I remember we saw several young people, 20s and 30s, who came in with COVID who died very quickly without evidence of involvement of their lungs. And so we thought in those cases, it was most likely the myocarditis. And those who get severely ill, uh, 20 to 30% will develop kidney failure and requiring dialysis. I mentioned the, the blood clotting or uh, that can lead to strokes. We saw plenty of older adults who went to a hospital with stroke and were diagnosed with COVID. That was their first uh, symptom. And there's many other symptoms, as you know, fever, not everybody gets fever, but that's a prominent symptom. The loss of sense of taste and smell is something very specific for COVID. Not many other things will cause that. Um, gastrointestinal symptoms like abdominal pain, vomiting, diarrhea, lack of appetite. This was really common in our older adult population where we'd see people just kind of stop eating, then they get weak, they'd have a fall, go to the emergency room and be diagnosed with COVID general body weakness and aches, headaches, fatigue, sore throats. A lot of times it was, could have been mild and like just a, a cold or flu. In, in, in the older adult population, about 30% had no symptoms whatsoever. So the mild illness may last just a few days, up to a week or two, but the severe illness can go on for weeks to even months. And before I talk about long COVID, um, I just want to give some important caveats. And, and the number one thing is that you really cannot describe well something that is not defined. And unfortunately, long COVID is not defined. Experts have not agreed upon a name or a case definition for this syndrome of persistent COVID-19 symptoms. And some of the potential names out there that I found in the literature, so long COVID is one of them, long haulers, post-acute COVID, chronic COVID, post-COVID syndrome, post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 or PASC. So we don't really have a, an agreed upon name for this. I looked at a number of published studies and there's like over 18,000 at this point. So a lot of information out there about it. And certainly there are some common things. There are some things that you find in, in kind of every study, but they all define it somewhat differently. So it's hard to kind of compare apples to oranges and come out with with really solid overlying themes. That leads to a lot of variability in the reported prevalence, so how common it is and the impact that the symptoms may have. That being said, what is it? Um, there is no standardized name or definition. There's no standard case criteria, like how many symptoms you have to have to be called long COVID, what types of symptoms those may be. There's many different time periods of the, the studies that I reviewed. Some of them would say it starts at two weeks after illness. Others say three weeks, four weeks, six weeks, or 12 weeks. So that makes it really difficult. It seems that most agree that symptoms after about four weeks, unless someone's severely ill with COVID in the hospital, and I've seen some patients who have been in the hospital for two or three months with COVID, but in the most cases, symptoms after four weeks seem to indicate long COVID. And some would break that down into a subacute phase, which lasts from four to 12 weeks, and a more chronic phase, which goes beyond 12 weeks. That's from the Nature Medicine article I have down here. The bottom line is this is something, symptoms that continue or start after the acute illness is over. So the symptoms may just be ongoing, or they can come and go. And interestingly, new symptoms that someone didn't experience during their acute COVID may appear weeks to months after that acute illness is over. Now this ongoing syndrome 
symptoms does not indicate that someone is contagious. We know that the uh, the tests can continue to be positive for three months. That's because the PCRs are so sensitive. They pick up just little bits of virus, bits of broken down virus that the body can be clearing out for several months after infection. So it doesn't mean if someone has a persistent cough or persistent you know, fatigue that they're still contagious. And this syndrome is not unique to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, the two other coronaviruses that cause SARS, which caused a lot of problems 15, 20 years ago, however long that was, uh, that's the severe acute respiratory syndrome and MERS, the Middle East respiratory syndrome. So both of these are also coronavirus diseases. Both of those were reported to lead to long lasting symptoms very similar to, to COVID. So how common is it? As I mentioned, the estimates vary pretty widely, but it seems like it's pretty common among hospitalized patients. So 75 to 80% may uh, of hospitalized patients may experience some kind of ongoing symptoms. Uh, less common among those who are not hospitalized, 10 to 35%. Uh, we don't really have a good estimate for how common it is among people who are symptom, who, who didn't have any symptoms at all initially. But definitely more common in those who are sicker or had more symptoms. One study I read said that if you have five or more symptoms of COVID initially, then you're more likely to have long COVID. But we do know that also people who didn't have any symptoms initially can develop some later on. Also seems to be more common in those who are older, those who have more medical conditions and more common in women than in men. So how long does it last? This is also not well-defined. And I think more and more information is coming you know, as time goes on in this pandemic, but it seems pretty clear that it can last longer than six months. Now the best, probably best done study that I saw was one from Wong uh, out of China, published in Lancet earlier this year. And in that study, they had about three or 400 patients who had been hospitalized with COVID. And then at six month mark, they actually called them back. They contacted them, they had them come in, do very careful surveys. They had blood tests done. Some of them had chest x-rays, CT scans. They had exercise tests, et cetera. So it really documented what was going on. And in that study, 75% of hospitalized individuals had at least one symptom at six months after the acute illness. Then another large study, an international online study of people who had had symptoms for more than 28 days um, showed that uh, the average time to recovery more than 35 weeks. So 90% still had symptoms at that time period. Um, and at that time period, 45% still had not been able to return to work full time. They had to reduce their work hours and over one in five had not returned to work at all. So this one was not as carefully done. It was self-reported. Um, it was a much larger group. Um, it was, uh, they reached out through COVID support groups. So probably those who were more affected by COVID, obviously, if someone had, you know, maybe a shorter period of long COVID had recovered and to work may not be reporting this survey, but this graph here is from that study, and it shows that with time that the severe and very severe symptoms become less common, and they tend to become more mild, moderate sort of symptoms, so that's at least good news. So what can long COVID do, or how does it present? Um, the most common general symptom, number one, seems to be fatigue, that, every, that most people have some degree of fatigue that is worse than it was. Now, we all sometimes have fatigue, right? That's kind of part of life, or tiredness. But this seems to be a tiredness that is worse than what is normal. Other common symptoms that seem to come out through many studies are headache, shortness of breath, and then mental issues, difficulty concentrating and with memory. But there's a whole variety of different symptoms that have been reported, and they can involve the pulmonary system or the lungs, the cardiovascular system, which is the heart and blood vessels, the endocrine system, which are the hormones and the glands that produce them, the neurologic symptom the systems, the brains and, and nerves uh, can have psychological effects, effects on the kidney, the skin, stomach, intestines, or the musculoskeletal system, the muscles and bones. So I'll go through each one of those individually. This graph from scientific report or this diagram, kind of a busy diagram, but it's, it's, it kind of puts it, it nice, I think presents it nicely, where this was a meta-analysis of about 20 different studies. Unfortunately, those 20 different studies had different time periods. They may have asked people at 
two weeks after their COVID symptoms, at four weeks as long as 12 weeks after. But again, the primary symptom seems to be fatigue followed by headache. And so then these other things in yellow were the more common symptoms. Um, prob problems with attention, hair loss, dyspnea, which is shortness of breath, chest pain, breathing fast. So things dealing with the lungs, brain, et cetera. Now in the lungs, it seems shortness of breath is one of the most common symptoms or persistent cough. I have a colleague who works in a local fire department and she monitors all of the firefighters who had COVID and, and they, they got hit pretty hard uh, through, their ex, through their exposure, dealing with you know, bringing people to the hospital. And she has a handful of young, very healthy men who were so severely impacted they have not been able to turn, return to work because their ex, exercise capacity is so affected by COVID. So reduced exercise capacity is something else that has been documented. Those who had very severe COVID initially may have a long-term scarring of the lungs. And from that China study, one out of five hospitalized patients had abnormal lung function still present after six months. And even those who did not require oxygen still had a long-term decrease in lung function. The heart and blood vessels, it seems like uh, chest pain is a common finding. Palpitations or abnormal heartbeats or abnormal heart rhythms is something else that's fairly common. I mentioned before in the acute disease, you can see heart inflammation or myocarditis. Now imagine if that inflammation kind of persists, kind of brews on a lower level, that may with time weaken the heart muscle and cause decreased heart function or heart failure, or it also can lead to an increased risk of heart attacks. Um, this one study estimated that people who've had COVID are over five times more likely to have a heart attack in the months following COVID than those who did not. Less commonly, but also reported are an increased uh, heart rate at rest. So just, you know, having your heart running faster than normal when you're not doing anything, as well as dizziness upon standing up or postural hypertension. So when it gets up and their blood pressure drops down, they feel dizzy. Uh, additionally, those abnormal clotting that we mentioned before that can happen during the acute disease can also occur afterwards, leading to stroke or you know, blockages in the lungs. So brain and nerve symptoms also seem to be very common, headaches being the most common, but, but very close after that, um, this kind of what's called brain fog or an impairment of thinking and concentration. Uh, having a difficult time with memory, having a difficult time with language, remembering particular words, and just overall mental functioning seems to be affected in many patients and sometimes for a long time. The loss of sense of taste and smell may also persist long-term. In most people, it does get better and recover, but some may last longer. Um, and then what's been reported also are nerve inflammation or neuropathy, since there are receptors um, on, the, uh, on the nerves for the virus. And that's something that can occur after the acute infection. Psychiatric problems also seem to be very common. Um, anxiety and or depression was reported in one out of four of those hospitalized Chinese patients at six months after the illness. Some patients display symptoms of post-traumatic st stress disorder or PTSD. It seems that many have also sleep disturbances or have inadequate sleep. Um, and almost 20% have a new or recurrent psychiatric disorder within three months of COVID illness. And interestingly, about a third of those are completely new conditions that occur in that time period. Now in the endocrine system or the system that, that uh, creates our hormones, um, interestingly new or worsening diabetes has been uh, reported. Uh, about three, people who've had COVID are about three and a half times more likely to develop diabetes in, in, in the period after COVID than controls. And I, I met a person recently who had two colleagues in uh, Central America who had developed COVID. One of them had no family history, no history of diabetes, developed oh. severe diabetes afterwards requiring very high insulin levels. The other one was pre-diabetic beforehand and developed frank diabetes after COVID. So that seems to be fairly common. The other gland it attacks is the thyroid gland, and that can lead to inflammation of the thyroid, which sometimes means it can be overactive and other times underactive, and can also cause the immune system to attack the thyroid and autoimmune thyroiditis or Graves' disease. So th these are things to look for after COVID. 
also reported is weakening the bones or bone demineralization. So other organs or things that can be involved, hair loss seems to affect about 20% of people who've had COVID. The reduced kidney function, so if someone was severely ill with, with um, COVID and, and had kidney injury during the acute illness, that may persist. And again, in the China study, they did find that a certain proportion of them had reduced kidney function even six months after the illness. Um, chronic muscle and joint pains is something else that's fairly common in people that have had uh, COVID as well as chronic nausea or lack of appetite. And we saw that, I saw that, but I've seen that personally a lot in the older adults who they've recovered, their fever, cough, and other things have gone, but for weeks to months afterwards, they just are not hungry. They feel full and they continue to lose weight and kind of waste away. It's a very sad thing. So in summary, um, long COVID is a syndrome of persistent, recurrent, or new COVID symptoms occurring after recovery from acute illness. It's more likely to occur in those who are more severely ill, but can also occur in those who had no symptoms or were mildly ill. There's many different symptoms possible and it can affect someone's ability to work or function sometimes for months after the illness and definitely can last beyond six months. And we don't really know how long it can last just as time goes on, I think we will learn more. And there's really no specific treatment for this, no medication. There are some approaches to a sort of gradual um, reintroduction of activity and certain things that can help, but it's very, since it is so ill-defined, there is no you know, definitive treatment for this. And I'm, I'm happy to take questions afterwards, but before I close, I just wanted to, to talk, just one touch on vaccines. I think that um, you know, there's still a lot of, misperceptions about the vaccine out there, about the safety of the vaccine, the side effects. And worldwide, there's been over 4.5 billion doses given. This vac these vaccines are not new. A lot of people have gotten them and they are safe. Yes, everything in life has potential side effects or potential risks, but I think in this case, the benefits far outweigh any risks of vaccine. They're very effective at preventing COVID. Now here in the United States, we are seeing breakthrough. We're seeing breakthrough mainly due to the Delta variant. But what we're seeing is that fully vaccinated people are much less likely to have se severe disease, end up in the hospital, or to die from it than our unvaccinated people who get Delta. So I think that makes it even more important to get the vaccine at this point, at least in, in, our, uh, in our area. The other thing is if you don't get COVID, then you can't get long COVID. So if you have not been vaccinated or if you have friends who have not been vaccinated yet, I would highly encourage them to get vaccinated and get vaccinated as soon as possible. These are the main references that I use. They're all available online if you'd like to look up any of those studies yourself. And uh, thank you, happy to hand it over to whoever will be speaking next. Thank you, Dr. Halim, for this great presentation, for summarizing all this information in very succinct presentation. Uh, so we have here, what are the symptoms, how people, uh, what kind of symptoms could experience. So now we will hear from the people directly, and let's start with the testimonies, uh, how they get infected and how have been the experience of the consequences post-COVID. Uh, let's start with Constanza. Could you share a little bit about that, how? you get infected and the consequences? Sorry, one of the consequences of COVID for me is the inability to move properly the mouse and use the computer. So first of all, thank you so much, Claudia and the team for this lovely invitation to participate in this important informative seminar. Um, as Claudia mentioned at the beginning, I wear many hats in the, in the uh, field of health. But today I'm just speaking as a person, as a regular patient, and um, trying to transmit to you the personal experience of, of, uh, of difficulties that COVID presents in a regular life in, in, in a family and an individual person. I got infected with COVID on December 2020. It means nine months ago. And even though I have a very mild disease that lasted only eight days, um, after um, a period of time, like maybe a week after I was done with the 
mild symptoms, little headache, uh, very low fever. I started developing uh, weakness and tingling in my hands and my arms. And it quickly um, uh, surpassed that level to reach the level of um, parallax paralyzation or paralysis, lack of control of the movement in my four extremities. So I lost the ability to walk. I lost the ability to move. I lost the total control over my body, but still I was, feel, I, I was feeling pain and discomfort, which is, was um, something, something very difficult to manage because I was totally aware of what was happening to me but I couldn't um, even speak. I lost the ability to swallow, to chew, to speak. And I also developed facial paralysis to what it came to be uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a immune disease that affects the peripheral nerves in my entire body. I was hospitalized um, for a month, two of the uh, two weeks of those uh, time at that time I spent it in the ICU, um, every day facing death and um, with the fear of long-term disabilities. It's been nine months, and as, as I mentioned before, and I still have uh, paralyzed uh, my right arm and I'm right-handed, so you all can imagine how difficult life ha ha has been for me this, this time. Thank you, Constanza. Um, could we hear also from our colleagues from the field? They are um, sending our the testimony. So please uh, start with Rachel. Sure. So um, I'm reading on behalf of um, a community health worker. Um, this community health, health worker says, I got infected from a visit to a bank that I have to go to frequently to make payments. In the first COVID wave, I took good care of myself and my family. We practiced hand washing, used hand sanitizer, wore our masks and ate nutritious food. But in the second wave, we relaxed the measures. I remember that I started feeling flu symptoms at the beginning of the year. I didn't pay attention to that. It started with a little cough and the next day I felt uh, tired already and had very low energy. I could not walk well. I decided to take some medicine because I thought it was a common cold. I felt better that day, but at night I began to feel more cough, fever, and shortness of breath. There were moments when I could not breathe well. This continued for several days and I began to suspect that I had COVID because my mother also started showing symptoms. That was when I decided to contact the health facility. It was a Friday and when the person in charge answered me, they, they said they did not have a test or a doctor available. He recommended paracetamol, but my fever did not go down and my cough continued to get worse. Since I already had symptoms for eight days, I decided to go to another health facility. They tested me and the result was positive. Thank you. Um, and the last uh, testimony unit. Great. Uh, so here's the testimony from our colleague. My role at CMMB requires that I interact with healthcare providers and health facilities and at the community level. Early this year, I woke up one morning with extreme fatigue and a fever. After two days of struggling with the fever, I visited a doctor at the nearby hospital and was treated for clinical malaria. The symptoms subsided for a day, but got worse a couple days later. After another, another two visits to the hospital, the doctor diagnosed my symptoms as myalgia and I requested a COVID test. The doctor who had seen me twice was quite reluctant, but since I was beginning to experience additional symptoms, I insisted that I needed to take the test. I had begun experiencing hallucinations, insomnia, and was getting startled quite often. A doctor friend who had been observing my symptoms and how I was progressing decided to, to start me on COVID treatment protocols, even prior to taking the test. My test results came back positive. I had started treatment a few hours before the test results came in. Two days after starting treatment, I developed a severe gastritis. I could not retain any food, water, or oral medication. Because of this, my fevers were uncontrolled. I was sweating a lot and had to change my clothes twice every night as they were drenched in sweat. As my symptoms worsened, my doctor tried to have me admitted, but all the hospitals were full. My oxygen uh, saturation declined to only 84%. 
on the 13th day after the onset of treatment, I finally got a bed in one of the hospitals. This was after a great deal of negotiations and lobbying from HR and the insurance company. Two important steps changed my course. First, I was immediately put on oxygen. And second, all my medication was switched from oral to intravenous and intramuscular. This relieved my system symptoms, uh, systems a great deal. And my body began the slow path to recovery. The ward that I was admitted to was quite full of patients struggling with, with breathing problems. Seeing patients all around me coughing severely was quite traumatizing. The facility was overwhelmed with patients and patient care was quite fragmented and without much sensitivity. It could have been that the healthcare providers were scared of the patients and therefore quite insensitive to their symptoms and needs. After being hospitalized on oxygen for nearly a week, I was discharged and went back home. I was quite happy to be away from the hospital. For the next two weeks, I struggled with severe malaise and a cough. My COVID test remained positive after three cycles of testing every two weeks. The biggest struggle for me was insomnia and being startled, which I dealt with for the next three months. I regained complete function after three months. Thank you so much. As you could see it, how many of the symptoms that are expressed uh, by uh, our speakers are were presented by Helene. But, uh, but also we see here is not only the symptoms, it's all the barriers and limitations that also they have faced. And they start from the identification of the disease and then what happened in the health facilities and, and what they need to face to be able to start the process of receiving a treat, testing treatments and their rehabilitation. I would like to hear a little more from you, Constance, about how, how you deal with these uh, consequences in your life. Can you hear me well? I'm receiving here a note that my microphone is low. Is that all right, the volume? Yes, it is. Okay. Well, um, as, as uh, I told you, Claudia, before, when we were preparing this, this presentation and this seminar, um, there are no words to really express the dimension and the different aspects of life that uh, a consequence, a long-term consequence or short-term consequence of COVID represents uh, for a person, for a family, for uh, employees, for the health system, for an entire country's economy. Um, and in, in my personal life, um, as I mentioned before, uh, after a month of being hospitalized, uh, facing death and difficulties, I, I went back home, I came back home in the wheelchair and started little by little the process of learning again how to swallow, how to speak, how to move my face a little bit better and how to walk and use my, my arms again. And um, in that process, of course, I've been, I had not been able to go back to work because I'm still uh, dealing with everyday therapy. Uh, I have physical and occupational therapy and I have regular checkups and tons of medicines to take every day and um, lab tests and other paraclinics to, to be made every month. So I, I would say, Claudia, to be sincere with the audience and with you that my whole life had been turned upside down. And, and of course, as Dr. Calvert mentioned rightly, the the depression and the anxiety and all the difficulties of the mental health that it um, that it also um, brings you now in, in the life of a person and a family. I'm a wife. I'm also a mother, and all those things have been totally um, uh, disarranged um, for me. Um, the first part was that I was very happy because COVID for me was my, very mild, but even as a doctor, I did, never expected this disease to be so cruel and so long lasting and so devastating in the life of a person. And on my side, as a patient in the clinic, in the health facilities, in the doctor's rooms, in, in the general um, 
society uh, activities, the, the small, the little reduced ones that you can have. I see other patients along my side walking the same path, in, if not worse. And um, so besides the personal barriers, I also ex experience, of course, the lack of the ability of the health system to deal with these terrible um, pandemic, the, the lack of capacity, uh, especially in undeveloped countries, and all the other barriers that a person, in the, my specific case, a person with disability and and um, and being a handicap can 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 face now. So I'm sorry if I don't have any more words, Claudia, for you and the other uh, other people. But I'm happy to take more specific questions if you if you have. No, that's fine, and and thank you so much. Uh to open your hearts and your emotions, share all that with us. I think it's for us, it's very important to hear. Um, that's a great testimony. Thank you so much. Uh, if, Unit, if you have anything else regarding to this question from our colleague? Yes, of course. So sharing again from our colleague. Then Samian hallucinations were the most difficult to deal with, especially since my role requires me to be mentally alert and to be able to provide thought leadership. First, my colleagues were very supportive and allowed me to work from home, especially during the time that I was still recovering from the physical symptoms. I opted to resume work because being away from work also affected me. Engaging in work-related tasks helped me regain some normalcy, especially when struggling with the hallucinations. Second, my strong support systems, especially my family and my friends, played a big role in managing the stigma related to COVID. Thanks. Let's pass to... Rachel from the community health worker on behalf of them. Um, I work as a community health worker and I'm also a mother. I used to walk a lot quick and without any problem for kilometers. When I started to recover, I realized that I could not walk for more than a few meters before getting tired. I had to rest for a while to be able to continue walking. I thought, could it be because I'm wearing a new mask? Could it be that COVID just left me this way? I felt mostly recovered by March, but a month later, I started coughing again almost daily. Since then, my cough has continued and I still get tired easily. Now my tasks take more time, but I need to be patient with myself. The doctor prescribed vitamin C and told me that it would not go away overnight. He recommended that I only have hot drinks, nothing cold, and I work out my lungs by blowing bubbles and balloons. He said, I just have to be patient and continue with these exercises little by little. Thank you. Uh, remember, we have the chat box. If you have questions for any of our speakers, please uh, write your questions there. And with this, I will do my last question, but I, I will start with Dr. Helene this time. Is any final message that you want to share with our audience today? Um, no, I just want to thank the uh, people who gave the testimonials. I mean, that makes this so much more powerful, I think, um, and demonstrates very nicely and disturbingly how this disease can affect people. Um, I, I must say in the last year, <laughs> I've probably... Uh, experience some of those psychiatric symptoms of COVID, just the, the anger over people denying that COVID was an issue and actively working against us, the, the, you know, depression over all that. Um, so I really, really wish that everyone could hear this and, and, and believe that this is a serious issue and really get the vaccine and help to promote the vaccine because that's, that's ultimately the answer. Not until we have a whole world. I mean, everybody needs to get access to this vaccine because if we don't in other you know, in countries that are lower resource and have less access to the vaccine, the new variants will come up. You know, we, in the United States, we thought, okay, we're done. We're done. We've got a couple of months where things were really good. And then Delta came. So until every country has high levels of vaccination, new variants will come up and there's nothing to keep those variants from, from spreading around. Um, and, and, and so to stop this, we really need to work worldwide to get everybody vaccinated. Thank you. 
uh, unit, could you go next? Sure. So here's the final message from our colleague. What we have, what we have learned during the time of COVID should help us rethink what kind of support we can provide. The one size fits all approach may not be entirely sensitive to the needs of all teams in the organization. Perhaps this may, may require focus group discussions with different teams to understand the emerging needs and how they can be addressed. And my last point is for prevention. If you want to help your family, communities, friends, and colleagues, take care of yourself by following preventative measures, including stress management. Thank you. As you see, we are getting more insights for the organization. And let's hear now from the community, Rachel. Um, so when I saw in the news how many people were dying from COVID-19 and then people close to me and people I knew also died, that made me think, we can be fine today, but who knows what will happen tomorrow. Before having COVID, I thought, why follow all these guidelines if I don't have it and no one around me has it? But this year after having COVID, I understand that it is really something ugly. In addition to the symptoms that I already described, I completely lost my appetite, I couldn't smell, and people were afraid to be close to me. All of this has made me reflect. It may be at random that God selects us, but I feel that God gave me an opportunity. Many people have died. I'm thankful that I did not go on to another life. We must value life and continue taking care of ourselves, following the preventative measures that we can. And it's not just me, we must take care of all our family and others. As community health workers, we also need to talk with young people. They go out on the street so they can be asymptomatic and bring this disease home. But at home, we have other loved ones, dad, mom, grandparents, children. I was the source of infection in my house and my mother was infected through me. Thank you for these powerful words uh, that they are bringing. And Constanza, I would like to close that part with you. What is your final message for our audience? Um, and also, I the clarification. Yeah. Constanza, I just clarify one thing. Do you have the chance to, at that time when you got sick, it was in Colombia vaccines available for, for the people no, of your age? Sure, you no, know, Claudia, you know that the inequities in health um, showed up in huge manner during these events. Um, and unfortunately in Colombia, we didn't have any vaccines and very, uh, in, in many parts of the country, a very low resources to really face the pandemic. As Dr. Calvert mentioned at the beginning of her presentation, if the United States didn't have enough tests, um, can you imagine how this uh, countries in Latin America, or I imagine in, a, in Asia and in Africa, um, were facing you know, to handle the pandemic. You no, know? so we didn't have vaccines, and actually nowadays uh, we are still face we are still facing lack of vaccines. People getting the first dose, but not the second, uh, because of simply uh, lacking of resources. But I would like to add my voice to the previous. Um, panelists to emphasize the, the role of prevention. Um, I think that uh, there is this uh, big work that is being done or trying to be done by the health uh, system, and that's very important, but it's also important the role that we have as individuals, as the family members, as a co-workers, or as, a, as a regular persons in the everyday life to promote um, a culture of not stigmatization, a culture of uh, talking openly about COVID, uh, uh, talking openly about uh, the need to wear properly the mask, not only in the mouth, but also covering as it should be the nose all the time in every place. Um, the need to, in, um, to promote vaccination for people who have the vaccines available is, is very difficult. And I join my voice to Dr. Carter saying that it's, it's, 
for us, dealing with the long consequences and very devastating consequences of COVID is, is unacceptable that being, um, that having vaccines available, people don't use it, them or refuse to use them and promote conspiratory theories um, that undermine the work of the public health uh, practitioners around the world. So um, I think it's very important to do as much as we can as uh, public health practitioners, health, community health workers, but regular persons to encourage a culture that accepts COVID as a, as a threat to humanity and deal with it in, in the ways we can, uh, and we have accessible right now, the hand washing, the um, physical distancing, the use of face masks properly, and especially vaccination. That would be my message. I don't really want anyone to um, have to walk the path that I have walked this nine months, last nine months. Thank you, Constanza. Thank you for, for sharing this. And uh, this is super, super important for us to listen uh, that testimony from first hand. Uh, we are now going to the, we have nine minutes for questions. Uh, we have some in the, in the chat box. Uh, we'll start with Robert. Robert is asking, uh, and I think this is for Dr. Helene, is any evidence that Delta variants will cause unique long-term side effects? Yeah, good question. Um, I think it's just kind of too new for us. Um, I don't know. I haven't looked for anything coming out of India. Of course, the Delta variant started in India October of last year. Or it's what caused their huge surge. Um, so I have to look to that literature. But in the United States, it really didn't become the predominant variant until July, you know, showed up May, June. And then now uh, nationwide, it's a over 90% of the sequenced isolates are Delta. So it, for us, time will tell, we'll, we'll have to see. My guess is um, it may be, you know, that post COVID syndrome with this may be more common since it causes such higher levels of virus and sort of, you know, more severe disease, but whether there'll be unique symptoms, I really don't know. Thank you, yeah. Yes, we are learning, uh, still in a process of learning uh, and more research needs to be done as well. Uh, we have another question for you, Dr. Helene, that's uh, from Madeline Seron. And uh, she's asking, are any research behind how soon someone can the COVID vaccine after they get COVID? Um, yeah, so there's uh, the recommendations are that you can get it pretty much any time. I mean, you should wait, obviously, until you recover from COVID before you get the vaccine. Um, I had colleagues who, unfortunately, you know, got COVID um, after getting the first dose. And as soon as recovery and time period, were able to get the second dose and did fine. So there's no reason to wait. Um, People who've had COVID and recovered are unlikely to get it again right away, but there's, there's this, this mis-message out there, misinformation that you had to wait three months. You do not have to wait three months. Just wait until you are recovered and then you can get the vaccination series. And it does seem to help um, because the antibody levels will get boosted up by, that, uh, by those uh, vaccines. Right, thank you for clarifying that. Okay, now is the time to open the mics. If anyone want to do another questions or have comments for any of our panelists, please uh, raise your hand. Okay, uh, Ariel. Hello, good morning. Uh, this is Ariel Crisancho from CMMB Peru. Thank you uh, on promoting this session. I think to see the, the consequences uh, and, and, and features of COVID in the short and the long term is a paramount issue uh, because at least the testimonies and also what we have seen in many countries is that uh, there's a lot of challenges. Once you look for healthcare, uh, there are a lot of challenges on availability 
especially of personnel in Peru, accessibility, uh, and also on health system responsiveness, both on quality and opportunity. The late consequences of COVID that are not fully studied in terms of, of the needs of rehabil rehabilitation care, uh, mental support, uh, and, and, and social dynamics uh, addressing stigma uh, need to be need to be studied. Uh, uh, there are sequels both on physical, mental, and even social uh, features, and probably they are facing the same challenges uh, that. Uh, the COVID sickness phase in terms of availability of services, accessibility to them, even visibility in this moment. So um, on top of that, in many countries, uh, COVID has generated economic uh, family crisis that need to be addressed as well, because this uh, deepens the problem in the families. I think we need to, to have uh, more, more sessions like this uh, with field testimonies and from them take some alerts that we need to address uh, in the medium term as an organization. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel. And we have another question from Chuck. Uh, it's from Luke. Luke is asking, um, does the Delta variant seems to be larger treated to children, youth uh, than early strains? Um. It's kind of hard to say. Um, it does seem like there's more children being hospitalized in some areas of the country, but that could be, as I mentioned, it is more contagious than prior variants, uh, definitely more contagious than the alpha, which was sort of predominantly before it causes higher levels of virus. Um, but it could just be that it's, you know, children are the ones who aren't getting vaccinated or can't get vaccinated, those under 12. So, you know, adults who have been vaccinated are, are sort of relatively more protected. And so it, it may seem like it's, it's a larger threat to children, but um, really kind of hard to tell. I don't know, you know, if, if, you know, comparing this to prior waves, are there more children getting infected than in prior waves, or it's just that it's, it's, it's the proportion between children and, and adults has shifted. And Claudia, I just wanted to yeah. also one sort of final thing or I thought of, I just want to give a shout out to CMMB, um, especially the South Sudan group, because uh, having vaccination program is not really a line of business for CMMB, but South Sudan had the opportunity to actually deliver vaccines and, and went for it. It was a lot of work for them, a lot of struggle, uh, but they, they did it and that's a very low resource area. And now they're, I think, trying to do uh, more vaccination there. So kudos to CMMB for stepping out of their comfort <laughs> margin to try to promote vaccination um, in, in these areas. Perfect, thank you. Any other question? Yeah, um, I, I guess I just have one question. Um, I know we're nearing the end of our time, but um, for Costanza, um, can you just speak just briefly on, did you notice any change in how your family and friends were taking COVID maybe more seriously once they saw how seriously it affected you? Yeah, yeah, um, especially for my close family, um, the shock was so, so um, strong that they really um, started, uh, some of them, especially my brothers, my two brothers and my sisters started themselves uh, acting as uh, community workers <laughs> among uh, their uh, other extended family members and, and uh, close communities. And um, yeah, the, a, a testimony like that is, is not, of course, my intention, but you become a, a point of, of reference of how difficult and how devastating, as I mentioned before, the disease can be. So um, yeah, definitely people who have known about these uh, consequences of COVID for me have been, I think, extremely careful getting in line for hours to be the first to be vaccinated, for example, and pushing other people who are reluctant or, or doubting about it, about the vaccines to, to receive the vaccine. So yeah, definitely. 
unfortunately, is is a is not the way that we want to learn things. But it just to take advantage of this situation to to become smarter in dealing with with that and prevent it. Thank you. And the last question, I, I know we are just on the time to close, but uh, Madeline has another question. Um, and it's to my understanding that uh, once someone have COVID and they have recovery phase, their bodies are still vulnerable. Is there something uh, families can do to not spot them or put them in a great risk? I think that Helene spoke about more about this and clarified. Um, I'm not sure what they what is what they mean by vulnerable. Um, certainly, as I think several of our speakers testified that you know you are very fatigued. You know maybe have lost weight, have had um, you know difficulty sleeping, etc. Um, so I think, you know, they're not going to get COVID again, um, at least not in the short period, but I think protecting them from other, you know, forms, there's obviously other viruses around and other illnesses they can get. So just being cautious, you know, taking the same precautions you would for COVID are going to prevent other viruses. We saw very little influenza last year because everyone was wearing masks and washing their hands. So try to protect them from other viruses you know, make sure they're, they're getting enough rest, getting good food, that, that sort of thing, uh, not overextending themselves. It seems like when people with COVID who are still recovering or try to do too much, they're going to get very fatigued. So just taking things slow and being cautious for, for other, um, to not expose them to other things needlessly. Thank you. And um, this part just remind me, uh, Constanza, uh, particularly, uh, when someone is uh, have another risk and say the immune system, for example, have a, a low, uh, have the immunity compromise for other disease. And I think in this case also Constanza could speak, uh, and if you want Constanza, and how much also the previous conditions could be um, exacerbated or facilitates how these uh, post COVID symptoms have been manifested on you. If you want to speak more about this? When you and baby mentioned Claudia that in my specific case I I always have had very low uh, white blood cell, cells count. I, it seems for some of the neurologists that are seeing me um, that it really could affect the way that my body responded to COVID in the first place and also the the immune response that attacked my own nerves uh, uh, after after that, you know. Um, I didn't mention that fortunately because of, of different reasons, I've been seen in, in different uh, health facilities by, by great doctors, not only in Colombia, but also in the United States. Um, for example, at, at Hopkins University and in Baltimore, I, I was there last month trying to get help for my arm. And unfortunately, one of the most difficult things for me is that no doctor in the world right now can tell me how much I will recover. If I would recover 90, 80% of my ability to move my arm again, or when I will do it. So this, um, this is other caveat of this terrifying situation in which COVID can put a person now. So yeah, previous conditions, in my case, these, these um, uh, kind of uh, strange uh, behavior of my immune system can also, could also play a role in my current disease. Thank you. Okay, we are closing. I think we have, we have learned a lot. Uh, we have many takeaways. First, start kindly listening to people who are suffering post COVID conditions. In the place where we are, where we work, we need to start listening then. And we need to think about this very seriously. Long COVID can be subtle, as we hear, but also it could be quite severe. Um, starting for, we, know, we don't know now for how long in some of them. Uh, as we saw in the testimonies, could be affected, uh, multiple body systems, organs, including our minds. So we, we need to 
to do more, uh, how we care, how we treat, how this, the rehabilitation systems will be in place to support and how we could understand how complicated it's for patients who experiment these things, the, all this process and how we are ready for them. Uh, this need to be addressed in a more comprehensive manner and an individual, but also in the health community uh, and organizational. We also have insights for our organization, the society, and we need this, the support that we do with this time. Uh, included more elements for mental health because it really is impacted in many ways, uh, our society. Thank you, Dr. Helene, with a great presentation, very informative, um, very practical. Constanza, thank you very much for your advocacy to put face in the numbers in the things that many times we read it. Thank you to our colleagues in the field, you know who you are. Thank you very much for give, uh, the response to share with the rest of the CMMB family. Thank you to our readers and thank you to all of you for your participation.